<laughs> Settled. Uh, good morning. I'm Tom Dewar, President of Education Minnesota, the state's educators union. I want to thank you all for being here. Today I'm here to call attention to a true crisis facing our state and the, and the opportunity to take action next Tuesday. And that's when voters in 78 districts will be asked to vote for school operating levies because the state's failure to sufficiently and equitably fund our schools. We urge voters in all those districts to look closely at the operating levies before them and consider the potential impact on their students. We're confident that when voters look closely, they'll vote yes on these questions. These were originally called excess operating levies, but the label doesn't fit anymore. We should be calling them school survival levies because the tool once designed to pay for school extras is now being heavily relied on to pay for basic school operations. Let me give you some examples. In Wilmer, the resources are so tight that in seventh grade social studies classes, there's only one textbook for every six children. In Byron, a failed levy will probably mean cuts to a program that helps intervene when children are struggling in math and reading. And in Rosemont Apple Valley Egan, a failed levy will mean even more children in almost every classroom, and that's on top of bigger class sizes for the current school year. Keep in mind that the physics classes in Egan High School are already 36 students, and that's double the number that research tells us is best for student learning. The fact that schools are in such a deep financial peril is a warning signal that cannot be ignored or denied. This map over here shows you the 78 school districts that are asking for operating levies. They're in red, and they're covering a quarter of the state, and they're in, never, in nearly every single corner of the state. The second map over here shows where current operating levies are in place. Those are in red. The 34 school districts that don't have one are in white, and nine of those white school districts are asking for levies next Tuesday. The expansion of operating levies is a warning signal, and it's indicative of a much bigger problem and that is our system of funding our schools is broken. A little over a decade ago when our high school students were just entering school, Minnesota was well above the national average in per pupil spending. Today, as a new generation enters our schools, we're well below the national average in per pupil spending. 19 other states, including Wisconsin, invest more in their school children than Minnesota. Today, you can count on one hand the states that have larger class sizes than Minnesota. Yet Minnesota remains at or near the top in graduation rates and in college readiness for our high school students. And that's a testament to our students, our parents, and our teachers. But we cannot expect to remain on top if we're not willing to solve this problem. We'll suffer the consequences of overcrowded schools and limited resources for generations to come if we don't address this situation. Minnesota's constitution mandates our state provide a uniform education to all children. Right now, Minnesota's failing to meet that obligation. Scores of operating levies are before, the scores of operating levies before the voters on Tuesday are proof of that. And you can tell by some of the examples we've used here today, that same thing. Editorial boards and community members across the state recognize this crisis. So next week, we hope voters will strongly consider stepping in where the state has failed. But even when they do, that will only be a temporary solution. You know, everyone claims holding edu holding, education holds the key to Minnesota's future, and we agree with that. So let's start asking our schools what they need to succeed instead of telling them what they can do without. The long-term solution to sustaining a strong and equitable education system lies in eliminating the Band-Aid approach to funding our schools. That will only happen when Minnesota's next governor and lawmakers live up to the mandate of our state's constitution. They need to join the citizens in 90% of our Minnesota school districts who've already demonstrated their desire to keep education a top priority. So we urge Minnesotans to vote yes for better schools next Tuesday, and we also urge them to join us next January in calling on newly elected leaders to fix this broken problem and put the responsibility of equitable funding for all of our schools back where it belongs, with the state government. I'd be happy to take any of your questions. We have with the Brooklyn Center School District. They've got another levy up. It's failed the past six times. It's been on the ballot. Can you talk a little bit about what options school districts like that have? The levy doesn't pass. 
Well, I don't know the specifics of Brooklyn Center, but like I said, these are about survival now. And Brooklyn Center is doing things like wraparound services with health care and nutrition right in their schools and trying to make their school a community place for their parents. And we need to make sure that we create an environment for the students, the parents, and the teachers to create success for all of their students. And so this just demonstrates the state's failure to make sure that our kids have what they need. Whether they live in Brooklyn Park or Black Duck or Bloomington, we need to make sure that their zip code doesn't matter in having a strong school system. If the levies don't pass, what happens? I mean, what, does something happen right away? Does something happen throughout the year? Well, the levies kick in next year. So if the levies don't pass, what you'll see is larger class sizes, fewer opportunities for academics. And in Carleton, it might close the whole school district. So it varies on place to place, and that's why we asked the voters to look closely at what their situation is. But it also emphasizes the point that our state funding system is broken and that we need to attack it on a system-wide basis, that it's equitable no matter where you live, that it's sustainable, that it's sufficient, and it's predictable so that we know what's going to happen. You can see that 90% of our voters, 90% of the districts, the voters have said, yes, we want education to be our top priority. Now we need lawmakers to join that and say, we're going to find a way to figure out how to fix this broken system. Now, all these are repeat levies except for the nine districts you mentioned? Yes. Okay. Correct. If, why, why is this a failure? from the government if the success rate is so good. Uh, we hear a lot of politics anyway about outcome-based. It sounds like the outcomes are pretty good. What we're doing is we're creating have and have-nots. And what the Constitution says is you have to have a uniform and general education system. You're seeing neighboring school districts don't have the same opportunities. You're seeing some school districts in the West Metro that can offer more opportunities than those in other school districts. So that's where the failure is, is that we have to provide an education system that allows our students to compete in the 21st century and in this global economy. And that's not happening. Will the next governor, as you say, live up to the mandate in the Constitution? We are going to certainly work with whoever the next governor is to make sure that they do live up to that mandate and that they work with the stakeholders and the community, work, uh, the community members because you can see that most Minnesotans believe that education be, should be a top priority. Now we need the lawmakers to step up and do theirs. Do you expect one of the candidates or some of the candidates to live up to it? Well, the reason we are endorsing Mark Dayton is because he says he's going to live up to that. He's going to increase funding. But whether it's Governor Dayton or Representative Emmer or Tom Horner, we're going to work with whoever that is and we're going to bring the facts to them about 90% of the districts say this should be a top priority and they need to make it their top priority. Can we make an equitable system given the budget shortfall over the next two years? Do you think that can be done or is that something that's going to take some time over the next four to beyond? I mean, is that possible? We need to take steps this next year to start correcting it. And whether it's completely fixed in the next biennium is not up to me, I'm not the expert in that, but we can find creative solutions for those problems and when we have a priority, I think that's what we need to do is create the situation where we can move towards an equitable system that's sufficient for all of our students. You were called candidate Ventura saying he wanted to increase money for education and then Governor Ventura got in and said it turned into a black hole and there's never enough money. How do you avoid a new governor falling into that same block? Well, I think what it is, it's an investment mentality. And so if you put money in, it takes 12 years to see some of the results. So Governor Ventura just waited less than 24 months to see if his investment worked. He also shifted some of the responsibility to the state, but he didn't get a revenue stream. And that's what's created some of this problem also, is, is the failure of connecting a revenue stream with his shift to the state taking over. He was trying to, cr to get rid of the inequity. But how about the feeling that there's never enough money? What's enough money? When is there enough money? When we meet the needs of our students, and what we, we, we put forward last year is targeted resources to the students that need it the most. We wanted to um, limit class sizes to 18 to 1. We wanted to put in nutrition and health services. So that's an investment, and that's targeted services towards those students that need it the most. So when you're investing, 
the question is, what do we need to succeed, not what can we live without? You say operating levies, and there used to be different kinds of levies, some were for building projects, some were for you know, administration, <coughs> salaries, whatever. Are operating levies now all encompassing, or how does that, any differentiation? Well, there's a difference between an operating levy and, and a building levy because the building levy, all that can do is go into physical structures. But these operating levies cover all those other pieces. They cover what kind of textbooks you can buy, what, uh, what type of personnel you can hire, what kind of um, comprehensive education programs you can provide. So there is a difference between an operating and a, a bonding levy. So do you see this map turning all white in terms of what you would like to uh, see happen? So nobody needs an operating money? We would like to see a shift towards that. You know, when they first came in, they were called excess. And so if they wanted to, you could add things. But we need to get back to the state taking its responsibility for funding. What is it we want our students to look like when they graduate from high school? What do we want them to be like? And so this map should become more white. And the excess levies shouldn't create inequities in where we're at. And, but doesn't an excess levy by definition create inequities because that provides more uh, opportunity for the students than a district without excess levy? What we need to do is make sure we have the baseline covered. And these are not baseline coverage anymore. These are survival levies. And without them, many of them are going to have to close their entire school district and not offer what they need are what the students need to be successful. How many districts are we going to have to close? Well, we know Carleton is a possibility. I don't know about others. We can get you that information. How about that number of 78 districts has been called historic. Is it the highest ask? Where does it fit historically? It's not the highest ask, but it's near the top. I think we had 90 plus school districts uh, a few cycles ago. But um, for right now, this is it's pretty historic, and, and you've got the nine that have never asked before that are going out. Is there a dollar amount to all the districts of how much money can be requested from taxpayers statewide? I'm sure we can get you that number, but that, does, that number doesn't mean anything because they're all going to individual school districts, so one might be getting two million and one might be getting a hundred thousand. So the total number, without knowing you know, what they're going to be going for isn't going to make sense, but we can get you the total number Is if you need Is there a differentiation it. now that people's property values may have gone down, the property taxes, I mean, is that, how does that impact schools? Well, it impacts what that's going to be on their value of their home for paying for these levies. So some school districts might think this is a good time to ask for a levy because the values have gone down, so it's not going to cost as much for the individual taxpayer. Um, to pay for these, uh, hopefully, improvements. But really, we've got to focus on what's the state's responsibility for this and making sure that the governor, the next governor, and the lawmakers live up to what 90% of the school districts are saying is we are going to make education a top priority. If you take the number that Ethan asked, is asking for and add it to what the state is now paying, is that enough money, or do you need more money than that to adequately cover education? Well, to what's the figure? What we want? To what the figure is going to be is what meets the needs of our students, and that's going to be different depending on their needs. There are some students that struggle more, so they're going to need more individual attention, so they're going to need smaller class sizes. Um, we need to match the needs of the students with the resources that go into that building or in that school district. And you're not willing to give us a figure? Don't have a figure. Would it, would it be taken care of if all those operating levies uh, were paid by the state, basically? It's going to be a step in the right direction. But you need more than that. We do, because some of these are, the state has failed in its responsibility. We're, we're spending $1,300 less than we did a decade ago per pupil. 19 other states invest more in, in education. The reason Minnesota has so many Fortune 500 companies is it has a highly educated workforce. It has a quality of life that people have said, we want to invest in our future. And that's what we're saying the state needs to step up for. Is, is a step in the right direction is a little step? Is it a major step? Do you need twice Ethan's number to adequately fund education? 20 times that number? What are you talking about here? Give us some idea. That's not my expertise. My expertise is to tell you what's happening in our schools. That's up to lawmakers to come up with what that number is. 
and we're going to work with lawmakers and those people that are experts on that. But I can tell you, when you only have one textbook for every six students, that's wrong. When you have to have class sizes that are double what research says, that's wrong. So what does it take? It takes to meet those needs. And that's going to be different for different school districts. What class was that? What you were talking about? One, one textbook for six students. What class was that? Seventh grade social studies. And the 1300 less per pupil, how, how does that reconcile with the fact we hear education funding or funding in the classroom has never directly been cut? Well, there's, there's so many categories. You know, you start getting in the weeds of how this system is put together. Right, but just for average voter, they hear from lawmakers, classroom funding's never been cut, but then you say we're spending less money per pupil. Well, we are. When you look at from when we started a decade ago to now, we're spending less money. Okay. So inflation? That it, part of it's adjusted for inflation, absolutely. So there is not a way to say that um, we're spending more money than we did a decade ago. You look at the funding formula, the basic funding formula, which is the one that's used a lot, that has either stayed stagnant or, or decreased. And you have operating levies, you have different categories that have taken up that uh, that piece of the funding. So we need to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. And what do our students need to be successful? And the state has simply failed to do that. Do you think, that in, given how demographics have shifted, there's an older population, oftentimes older people say, well, I don't have any kids in school, I don't need to vote for this levy. What's your response to a that argument, which is, you know, I mean, as the baby boomers getting older, there's a lot more of that argument. Is there? Well, I think the argument is, in order to have a strong community, you have to have strong schools. And you need to have an educated workforce that's going to go out and be part of the community and be successful and to help contribute to Social Security and other things that um, senior citizens and those that don't have schools uh, or kids in schools um, react to. So someone did that for their children and someone did it for them. So they need to make sure that they're still contributing to society in this way. Leaving inflation out, does education get more real dollars? Does it get more real dollars than, say, 10 years ago? No, it does not. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Um, you can, I think, I'm going to answer your questions. Right. Um, although I didn't, uh, uh, we didn't add up the numbers ourselves. I think MPR. I think it was NPR is reporting that these operating levies can add up to $82.5 million a year. Oh, okay. the school board also has that. Yeah. Um, and they usually, and I believe they have for either five, five to ten years, I think. Okay. Um, I think Carlton is the only one that we're aware of that will have to actually dissolve the district. But there are several school districts that are saying, you know what, we'll probably have to close a school. But I don't have an actual number on that. But only one district that you know would have to actually dissolve. That's called. Okay. So I don't know. Back to the office, I have a list of the nine districts that are going out. They currently don't have levies that are asking me to do that. So if you need that list, I can put it here. Yeah, I'll make sure you're going to post it up. Those got made kind of late, so I might be careful what you wish for. Yeah, it's very far out. Maybe I can make it in pan. What was the other?